everything looks bigger than life when you're five. So everything was big, everything was strange. And I remember feeling, I, I guess, a bit scared. Like, like many children, I remember my school years fondly, but the bits I remember fondly aren't the bits I should have remembered. You know, I remember the, the play and the sport and the naughtiness and the playfulness and the, uh, the mischief. In fact, I remember the bits that were non-standard. I remember being bored a lot. It didn't bring out the best in me, and, uh, um, you know, I got through it anyhow. So, it's, you know, it wasn't, I was not a great fit, or the system was not a great fit for me. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that we take all these children and we force them to try to adapt to this really complex bureaucracy, this, this system. The system should adapt to them. The origins of traditional education lie inside the military to a large extent. They needed identical people, soldiers, administrators and so on, so they produced a system. When the Industrial Revolution happened, they too wanted identical people in their assembly lines, even in their consumers. They wanted consumers to be identical so that everybody would buy the same things. So if you look at school that way, if you look at the fact that we process 20 or 30 kids at a time in a batch, just like in the factory, if you look at the fact that if you fail third grade, what do you do? We hold you back and we reprocess you. All matching the way the factory works. We built it on purpose. And it was really useful for its function but we don't have a shortage of factory workers anymore. We're probably at the, at the death of education right now. I think the structures and strictures of school, of learning from nine till three, uh, you know, working on your own, not working with others. Uh, I think that is, that's, that's dead or dying. And I think learning is, uh, is just beginning. The way we solve interesting problems is we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail until we succeed. And if you talk to people who have succeeded, what they almost all have in common is that they failed 100 times before they succeeded. And that what separates them from people who aren't successful isn't that they succeeded, it's that they failed more than the other people did. I'm not sure it's OK for the schools to say, well, we have to optimize to process as many people as we can to match this testing regime. You can't imagine in a world where you sit down to do an exam and you ask yourself the question, I hope there are no surprises on the exam paper. And your teachers think, I hope I've prepared him for everything. How would that prepare you then to go out into a world that every day is going to surprise you? You know, it's full of the surprises of, of the economy, of society, of politics, of invention, of technology. Every day is a surprise. Learning prepares you to cope with the surprises. Education prepares you to cope with certainty, there is no certainty. The teacher stands between the child and the formal education, trying to, to make the child face that system. And until that system breaks down or disappears, she has an incredibly difficult job of keeping the child's curiosity alive and at the same time saying, listen, by the time you're 16, you'll have to start memorizing certain things so that you can go and sit for that examination, clear it, and, and get out of school properly. No one I know takes standardized tests for a living. So why are we using standardized tests to see if you're going to be good when we don't have standardized tests after you take it? It's infected the entire marketing ecosystem of education because famous colleges are famous because they're picky about your SAT scores. Parents want their kids to go to a famous college. Parents push the school to create kids who will get into a famous college by doing well on the SAT, all of which is corrupting the entire reason we have education in the first place. If we can get parents and teachers and kids and administrators to have this conversation, to just talk about it, that if at school board meetings or if at tenure reviews, the questions we are asking are not how did your students do on the SAT? But instead we say, the SAT makes no sense, famous colleges are a scam, we need to create a different thing. And if we can have this conversation, then change will start to happen.